and on the roads are responsible for an enormous number of open wounds of all kinds. The best treatment for these wounds is a matter of national importance. In terms of manpower, it's estimated that in England and Wales, these injuries represent five million man days lost to industry each year. A million child days lost to schooling each year. And about four million days occupation of hospital beds each year. And that, in turn, means the services of a host of already overworked doctors, nurses, dispensers, secretaries, cooks, and others. All these accidental injuries represent a serious loss to the individuals themselves, as well as to the community and the loss is much greater when recovery is complicated by septic infection. Septic infection has prolonged this man's healing time from 15 days to 3 months, and in the end his right hand is stiff. It is no longer the fine instrument it used to be. This man has both hands severely crippled by infection following upon a burn. Let us first look at some of the microbes which cause these infections. Here you see the worst of them, the hemolytic streptococcus, as it looks under the microscope and also as a culture growing on a blood agar plate. This microbe causes erysipelas, scarlet fever, and many other common diseases. Staphylococcus is also very dangerous. This is what it looks like under the microscope. And on a culture plate. It causes several common infections, such as boils, whitlows, and osteomyelitis. Pseudomonas pyocyanea is another microbe which sometimes produces disastrous infection. Under the microscope it looks like a rod and has a filament attached to one end. When growing in cultures or in wounds it produces a characteristic blue-green colour. In hospitals where these infections are common, the microbes may easily contaminate bedding, pyjama jackets and blankets. From these, they may be conveyed to other patients. Unfortunately, there are also less obvious sources of infection. People going about their daily business may be unconscious carriers of some of these microbes. For example, about one in every 15 people harbour dangerous streptococci in their throats as shown by this culture plate. From these throats, the microbes can be conveyed to clothing and hands. A few people also carry streptococci in their noses and transmit them via their hands and handkerchiefs. Dangerous staphylococci are still more common. About four people in ten have this microbe in the nose and frequently also on the skin. The trifling injuries of daily life are very quickly infected by it. And when so infected, they become potential reservoirs from which the microbe can be conveyed to more serious injuries. Dust often harbours these microbes. It is partly composed of fluff from clothing and bedding and dried scales from the skin. Microbes of septic infection may get into the dust from saliva or sputum or from sneezing. They are known to survive in dust for many weeks. In hospital wards, the air is particularly likely to be infected. Great numbers of microbes have been found in dust during the process of bed making. The channels of infection resolve themselves into two categories. That of self-infection, in which the patient
patient's wound becomes infected with microbes from his or her own body, and that of cross-infection, in which the infection comes from some outside source, maybe another patient, a nurse, or a doctor. A diagram will help to make this clear. On the left, we see the chief sources of self-infection. The patient's own nose and throat, and his skin and clothing. On the right are the chief sources of cross-infection. The infected wounds of other patients, and the hands and instruments, as well as the nose and throat of the nurse or the doctor. From all these sources, the microbes can be transmitted to a wound in two ways. By direct transfer, that is, by droplets sprayed from the mouth while talking and coughing, or by physical contact with fingers, instruments, and surgical materials, which have themselves been previously contaminated. Or they may be conveyed by indirect transfer, by way of air and dust, perhaps from a considerable distance. During the last few years, new facts have come to light about this last process, thanks to the development of methods for counting and identifying the microbes present in the air. The instrument used for this purpose is the slip sampler devised by Bordillon. This diagram will explain how it works. The air to be tested is drawn by an electric pump into a chamber from which it escapes by one or more narrow slits. It impinges with considerable force onto the surface of a sticky medium in a revolving dish. A manometer indicates the airflow while the dish revolves. Most of the particles on which microbes are riding get trapped by the sticky medium, and when the dish is subsequently incubated, these microbes grow into visible colonies, which can be easily identified and counted. Here is some of the process in detail. First, you see the slit through which the air streams onto the sticky medium. The dish, with its medium, is put onto the turntable. The chamber is sealed, and the dish is raised nearly up to the slit. The machine is switched on, and the manometer indicates the airflow while the dish revolves. Slip sampler tests carried out in a room where surgical dressings were being done have given some surprising results, as you will presently see on plates exposed before and during this dressing. Here is the plate before the dressing was done. A sample of the air grew very few microbes. There are only about a dozen tiny colonies. This plate, exposed while the bandages were being removed, showed a much heavier growth of microbes due to a scattering of invisible particles from the dressing. As you see, there were some thousands of colonies, chiefly of coliform bacilli and staphylococci, with which the patient's wounds were infected. The significance of all this will be apparent when wounds are dressed in open wards, as in this case. Microbes are scattered in every direction and may easily be carried by air currents to the child in the next bed suffering from severe burns. Or to this child a little further off whose arm bandages have worked loose. Other tests with the slip sampler have shown a similar scattering of microbes whenever bedding is disturbed, and they often include types which are capable of infecting wounds. The relative importance of these different types of infection will vary. 
Clearly, a small wound will offer much less opportunity for airborne infection than a large wound. However, both are equally vulnerable to infection conveyed by dirty instruments or fingers. The bacteriologist employs certain simple principles for avoiding the transfer of unwanted microbes in his laboratory. His principles are these. He takes great care to sterilize his medium, heating it either in an autoclave under pressure, or in a steamer. And at all stages, contamination from the air is avoided as far as is possible. Test tubes are sealed with dry cotton wool plugs, and open dishes have glass covers. Doctors and nurses doing surgical dressings should employ exactly the same principles, sterilizing by heat anything which can be so treated, for instance, instruments, towels, and gauze. A strict no-touch technique in carrying out the dressing, and finally, the avoidance of airborne contamination. It will perhaps help to emphasize the precautions necessary if we show some of the mistakes commonly made in doing a surgical dressing. The nurse you see here is going to make a great many mistakes deliberately, the kind of mistakes that are being made every day by doctors and nurses. She first prepares her stock trolley, using her hands instead of sterile forceps, to transfer cotton wool swabs from their container to a bowl. You will notice that she wears neither face mask nor head cover. If she has any streptococci in her throat, she may, without knowing it, transmit them to the patient's wound. She's now ready to remove the patient's dirty dressing and takes a pair of scissors from her belt. This is a common mistake. She should, of course, have fetched a sterilized pair from the stock trolley. When she returns the scissors to her belt, infection from the patient's wound may be transferred to her uniform and so on to the next patient she treats. Whilst removing the dirty dressings, she makes more serious mistakes. In the first place, she uses her fingers instead of sterile forceps, and then discards the dirty dressings onto the trolley instead of into a bucket. With contaminated fingers, she collects sterile swabs from a bowl. Still using her fingers, she cleans up the wound. Sterile forceps should, of course, have been used. Finally, using her fingers again, she puts a sterile dressing onto the wound and then applies the bandage. Fortunately, the patient's wound is only a fake, and after an application of soap and water, she will be none the worse for volunteering for this chapter of deliberate mistakes. Continue our story of errors, the nurse now washes her hands, but not thoroughly enough to get rid of all dangerous microbes. She finishes off by drying them on an unsterile towel. The next patient has arrived. Without changing the towel on the trolley, which was contaminated by the dirty dressings of the first patient, the nurse prepares to treat his foot wound. You will notice that she uses some of the same bowls as before. Microbes from the first patient will almost certainly be conveyed to this patient's wound. Well, this is not how to do a dressing. It must be repeated that all the mistakes have been made deliberately and that the wounds were only fake. However, they are the sort of...
of this takes that cause infection in wounds, which in turn may considerably prolong healing time and interfere with the ultimate recovery of function. If large deep wounds become infected in this way, it may have very serious consequences. It may even result in death. 